is apostolic. Because Christ founded the church on the, on the apostolic, meaning the word apostolic means to be sent, on that apostolic mission of the apostles to teach all nations. The apostles were first, the first authoritative missionaries who founded and governed the first Christian communities, for example, you know, the four seas and others, the four apostolic major seas and other smaller Christian communities. Although there were 11 apostles, remembering that Judas died, killed himself, right? Actually, uh, they taught one deposit of faith, which we referred to last week, the deposit of faith, that they spread out on their missionary uh, ventures. And when there was conflict about the faith, they came together to address it, such as Acts 15 describes the Council of Jerusalem. And so we appreciate from there forward in history, you have the Council of Jerusalem. Yet for several hundred years, of course, as we know, the Christians were severely persecuted. So, of course, they couldn't you know, easily gather all their 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 community heads together, you know, they couldn't gather all the bishops together until uh, Constantine was converted, you know, and so he allowed, you know, Christianity to, you know, finally become free from the persecution with the Edict of Milan. So it wasn't until after then, of course, that the, the first council of Nicaea could gather together. <clears throat> so, you know, so in other words, my point being that, you know, uh, Acts 15 and the Council of Jerusalem is the model for you have all the majority of the apostles present and coming together in that authoritative unity in uh, Matthew 18. Jesus says, wherever two or more of you are united in my name, there I am in your, you know, among you. Whatever you ask of, I will grant it. You know, he's not referring to any Joe Shmo Christian. You've got to keep in context. He's referring, you know, so often you will hear that verse being used for just any two of us or more gathering together. But keeping in context of Scripture, Jesus is speaking to his apostles and those authoritative leaders. He says, We're, wherever two or more of you are gathering, alluding to that collective. And he just got done speaking about uh, when a, if a brother sins against you, take it to him personally. You know, if your brother sins against you, go try to resolve it. If he refuses to listen to you, you know, get a couple friends who recognize the sin of the matter you know, so they can basically you know, counsel him, you know, do an intervention, if you will. And then if he fails, if he uh, refuses his intervention, to tell it to the church. And then he says, tell it to the church. And then right after he says, wherever two or more of you are gathered. So he's referring to that authoritative, you know, that authoritative body that can basically declare, okay, you're being rebellious, you're being a rebellious Christian. Either you repent or, you know, you're outside the church. And you're basically excommunicating yourself because of your sin. So, you know, so Council of Nicaea, and then throughout the next 2,000 years, there were you know, several church councils. 21, I've, I remember correctly, up to the 1960s when Second Vatican Council, you know, so Second Vatican Council, if you, you, know, you kind of appreciate that Second Vatican Council was in the model of a, the biblical Council of Jerusalem. So here's one of our own successors of the apostles. This is Bishop uh, Michael Jekyll's who may, who is probably, hopefully, going to be there for your confirmation. So you will be confirmed, hopefully, if all goes well, by a successor of the apostles. So he's in that apostolic lineage, and so that's one of the really neat things is, you know, in that perpetuation of that authority of the church, that every bishop can, you know, uh, uh, if he, and actually, I've heard recently that it's, it would be hard, and it would be a lot of research to do. But apparently it's been done. Uh, Bishop, Archbishop Chaput of, formerly Archbishop Chaput of Denver, Colorado. Now he's been, I think, made Archbishop of San, uh, St. Louis. Uh, somebody as a gift did the research and looked up his apostolic lineage back to the apostles. So that's pretty awesome. But, you know, of course, I'm sure that took a lot of work. But so appreciate that the, you know every bishop, every bishop though, has that apostolic lineage. Whereas during the Reformation, uh, that was all that was lost because a lot of the groups did not have uh, bishops as their uh, heads of their churches. Uh, the Anglicans uh, try to claim that they do, but they didn't. Uh, what was it? I don't, I don't remember the details. But the research was done, especially back in the ninth, uh, the eighteen. 1880s or 1890s, Pope Leo, the, anybody help me out? Pope, one of the, Pope Leo the 13th, I think it was, 
he uh, issued an encyclical, basically after all the research had been done, saying Anglican orders have you know are invalid. So unfortunately, they are a Protestant schism. But however, that you have the East, the Eastern Orthodox, they're they're more appropriately understood as a schism and not a denomination as well. So they are part of the church, even though they're in schism from Rome. And so uh, very often, and I, I, I presume in his ecumenical efforts, Pope John Paul II would refer to the Eastern Orthodox as, and the Catholic Church as two lungs of the church, you know, trying to, you know, of course, reconcile that unity. But still, appreciating that unity, that you know, we're all part of the same church and we're like two lungs. They're one you know, organism or one uh, organ for breathing. You know, they're, they're, they're united. But you know, in a, unfortunately, at this time, they've divided. But you know, there's a lot of hope that there will be reconciliation with the Eastern Orthodox. <clears throat> First Timothy, the teaching on the bishops, the biblical teaching. Saint Paul says, "This is a trustworthy. The saying is trustworthy. Whoever aspires to the office of bishop desires a noble task. Therefore, a bishop must be an irreproachable, married only once." Now he doesn't say that he has to be married. He says can't read that into this, of course. And of course, back then, a lot of the early bishops were. You know, St. Peter had been married, and he refers to his mother-in-law. Uh, temperant, self-controlled, decent, you know, yada, yada. He goes on to give some good qualities. Basically telling Timothy, these are qualities in the men that you must look for as, you know, the bishops to, you know, take over the various teaching roles in the churches. The twofold structure of the Israel and the church. So, kind of get back to that kind of appreciation of the church coming out of Israel. You know, having that consistency. You have the Jewish priesthood and the Jewish lady. You know, that the Jewish majority of the body of the people. So, the Jewish priesthood was originally intended for all men. But of course, as I said last week, the golden calf incident. You know, it was so then it was kind of restricted to the tribe of Levi, and then the people took their sacrifices to the priesthood. You know, which, as I said last week, you know, the animal sacrifice had their symbolic representations. And now we have the Christian priesthood and the Christian lady. Christ reestablishing the priesthood for all men. And the Christian lady, again, like in the model of their Old Testament, you know, type. They take their the sacrifice, you know, they go, they unite themselves to the priesthood to offer up that sacrifice of Christ. The Christian laity, so the the primary functions of the lady, as I said, said before, is to be holy. That's first and foremost our, our, our calling, of course. Uh, stewardship, which is a you know, fancy word for our mission, our, you know, what, what God put us on earth here to do. You know, part of which is to our vocation. Our stewardship is to our vocation, whether the priesthood, the religious life, single life, married life. Uh, so the, the laity is to raise healthy Christian, you know, healthy Catholic families. Participate, and this is a lot of these point principles I'm pulling out of this. Uh, one of the, the same, uh, uh, one of the popes, uh, Pope John Paul II's encyclical is called Christus Fidelius Laici, which is uh, Latin for the lay members of Christ's faithful people. So basically, if you want to know your role within the church, this is a nice little thin booklet to get, and I have it in my office if you want to borrow it. <clears throat> and to cooperate with the priest would be in the last point. So part and participate and cooperate. The priesthood, the primary functions again to be holy, their stewardship of course again, fulfill their priestly vocation to teach, you know, to teach all nations part of that, the word of God, to the tradition of the word of God, to govern, to keep these communities. Of course, you know, if you know the apostles just went around from community to community as Saint Paul, you know, did at first, you know, and you know, set up these Christian communities, you know, if if you, they just left it at that and just taught them, you know, that's a limited resource, of course. Know, just to give them a teaching, just a kind of a core teaching, and then kind of go on, and then just leave themselves, leave them to themselves. You know, that's going to cause all kind of chaos. So of course they need the leadership. So you know they started instituting the, the bishops, you know, as, as to take over them, and then the bishops started instituting their you know right hand men, the priests, and then the deacons as, as well, having a, you know another function. So <clears throat> to keep that kind of governing order, you know, to kind of keep the communities held together, you know, as we read from Ignatius. And to administer the sacraments, of course, you know, if, you know, 
if you know, as we know from since the Protestant Reformation, you know, we have all kinds of views of baptism. You know, some Protestants recognize that it's effect it's an effective you know effective sign of washing the soul. Some say it's just a symbol. You know, so if we're left to our own interpretations, you know, without you know that governance, you know, there we can have all kinds of meaning for meanings for the sacraments, all the seven of them. You know. And then Father Dooling, you know, his little smile on face down here, he's going to talk about the priesthood you know, in more detail, of course, later on. So here's, a, here's some images I wanted to use just to convey kind of that consistency, that historical consistency. There's a, that's a, of course, a wax model of an Old Testament priest since there haven't been any <laughs> for 2,000 years. But, but just, but it's a, it's a very, they, of course, very, very accurately, you know, took the biblical description of, you know, that Moses uh, gave to the people to, they, had, they were like so anal about so much things, even the dress. And so, you know, they, you, so just the blue robes. I, so I very, but you know, the Catholic priests, you know, they wear various colors. But I picked one of, of uh, Pope Benedict wearing blue just to kind of, you know, convey that consistency, but you know, still that priestly, you know, Father said he's going to talk about that eventually as well. You know, the, even even the the garments that Catholic priests wear, you know, have biblical roots. And then, of course, in, in Eastern Orthodox, still, you know, even though they're in schism, they're, you know, still within that consistency. <clears throat> and then to conclude, finally, uh, I wanted to conclude on, within the structure of the church, of the laity and priesthood, I want to conclude on, the, of course, again, the importance.